Thanks, Reinhard. So as Reinhard mentioned, the center wants to engage as much as possible with responsibility in and around science. There's going to be ethical, political, epistemic aspects to, to that project. And we chose two speakers for our opening event whose work touches on all of them. Our first speaker is Nancy Cartwright, who, as uh, Reinhardt already said, needs no introduction. Her work has served as the starting point for so much of what we as philosophers of science do today on topics from causation, empiricism, modeling, laws, measurement, idealization, fictionalism, explanation, and so on and so on. Um, Nancy's work has convinced many philosophers to take a very hard look at particular scientific methods and to use that as the primary means of trying to say something about what we can do with science, what varieties of science are worth wanting, and especially how to bridge between internally good science and externally and ethically good uses of science. We're all really excited to have Nancy here with us today. A final remark about the format. As you can see, we're, being, we're recording this session. It'll be live streamed uh, and also posted later on the website. Please save your questions for the Q&A session where we're going to use the hand raise function that's native to Zoom. Um, and that's all from me. So Nancy, the Zoom floor is yours. And thanks again. Uh, thanks so much. I, I, it's a real honor. I'm excited about this center and I can't actually wait to be there in person. Uh, and um, I really do um, admire you for carrying forward uh, this kind of project. Um, and so I can do some slides and minimize you so I can actually see my slides. Um, I'm going to talk today um, about responsible science and in particular, I'm going to focus on responsible use as Mike suggested I might. Well, it's stuck and not moving forward. So what do we do about that? Mm. Uh, I guess go back out. I'm sorry, folks. It worked a minute ago when we tried it out. Let's go here. Yeah. Can you see something there? Yep. yep. Okay. That seems to be at the end, doesn't it? Let's just make sure it's the right talk. <laughs> and then uh, let's see if I give the, uh, do that. Ah, so it does move forward. Okay, sorry, here we are. Um, I'm going to um, base my talk on work I've done with uh, a team of people, uh, Eleonora Montuski and Thresher. And Eleonora is at uh, Venice Kafoskari um, and Thresher and Matt Solomon are postgrads at UCSD. Uh, there's me and then Jeremy Hardy, uh, who is an affiliate of both the LSE Center uh, for Philosophy, uh, the Natural and Social Sciences, and for our center at Durham. Um, and uh, Jeremy is a uh, work studied as an economist and was a, a, a businessman, and we've done a lot of work together. Um, the ideas uh, in th my way of thinking about responsible science today is going to be through a lens of objectivity. And um, the ideas come out of a book that we're just finishing with uh, Oxford Press called The Tangle of Science. Okay, so um, in general, I think there's a big issue about where, when we look at science and we want to evaluate science, where we should focus. And philosophers and science studies people, but mostly philosophers have tended to focus on theory models, claims, but models in the sense of, of, of being representative or making claims. And we've worried about their truth or acceptability. So uh, truth or acceptance. Um, I think this is a wrong place to focus if you're interested in responsible science. I think you need to broaden the focus dramatically <clears throat> and look at all the products of science. And just a few of the ones we consider are measures uh, like measures for the charge um, of, of electric charge or measures for happiness or measures for um, poverty, okay? Models, experiments, observational studies, narratives, technological devices, policy recommendations, and so forth and so forth. Um, we should be focusing on all of these. And of course, um, most of them aren't even truth apt. So we should not be looking at or so concerned with uh, truth or accepting them as we are with accrediting them uh, for uh, the uses that we uh, want to put them to. 
I think of all of these as tools that we have um, in that we develop and hone and uh, perfect uh, and put um, in, um, <laughs> we actually put them on the shelves uh, for others to use. Uh, so I think of there being um, that what's called accepted science is something like uh, uh, shelves where, where we put tools that other people can take down and use. And so there's two directions to this. One is putting tools on the science accredited shelves and the other is taking tools down from the science accredited shelves for use. And issues of responsibility obviously are going to come up on both sides. Now I'm going to say just a few words about uh, putting tools on the science accredited shelves. Uh, I do have some, some views about this, but it's not the focus, primary focus of today's talk, but just so, um, you know, what on earth does it mean to accredit or put them on the shelf or for them to be accepted? Uh, that's something that uh, philosophers of science and science studies people have had a hard time um, finding the right terminology, the right set of concepts to think about it. But the, it obviously is the case that um, uh, uh, models and measures and theories and claims are uh, get um, accredited. Um, and signs of their being accredited or that they appear in textbooks, peer reviewed journals, et cetera. And there is uh, following um, some of the work that Helen's done, uh, a community consensus, the right kind of community consensus, of course. And what else? I mean, what are the other signs of accreditation? And then um, what I want to point out is, I mean, independent of the study of responsible accreditation, I mean, what is it to be responsible in putting a tool on a shelf, which I, um, as I said, I'm not going to talk much to talk about today. Um, but I do want to point out that for theories, accrediting a theory and put it on the on the shelf for um, for use, um, uh, uh, you know, is quality assured, um, is not as philosophers of science have fussed about uh, that uh, taking them as really true. Uh, for instance, you know, it's really important that on the shelf of accredited uh, theory to take down and use is Newtonian mechanics, classical EM, etc., which at least those guys who believe that they've all been replaced by quantum theory, quantum field theory, uh, GTR and so forth, um, don't think they're really true. Um, they are nevertheless central items that have been properly accredited and put on the shelf, uh, quality assured shelves for use. Now, what I'm really gonna talk about um, for the rest of the time today and give some, some details for is taking tools down for use. Um, and this is uh, not only a topic, uh, a, a topic in the joint book, but it is a principal topic for the ERC funded project I've been uh, part of and running uh, for the last five years called Knowledge for Use. And that's a project at Durham, LSE and Venice Kafoskiri. So uh, my, what I want to point out is that you use, we used these various products of science, all the different ones. We use them in both pure science. So for instance, uh, we use Michelson interferometers in really pure science. We use them in testing general theory of relativity's claims about whether gravity waves can carry energy. And we also use the product, various products of science in applied science. Uh, for instance, we use the theory of low temperature superconductivity in designing magnets um, for an MRI. So there's no pure versus applied science issue here. Uh, I think a significant difference for some of the issues I'm raising when it talks about um, uh, responsible use. Okay. Uh, now we see uh, responsible use as um, closely intertwined with objectivity, or perhaps we've done it the other way. Um, for the Knowledge for Use project, um, we boldly claimed we were going to try to come up with a new take on objectivity, um, you know, that there were all these good ones around, but somehow they hadn't quite hit the spot that. And, um, and um, as it turns out, what we really are interested in is the very topic that the Weizsäcker Center is interested in, is objectivity, um, as it's closely connected with 
uh, responsible uh, science. And so objective science and responsible science we see is closely uh, connected together. Now, um, what I'd like to argue, what we argue about objectivity is uh, you know, there are various different ways to explain what objectivity consists in, in, uh, in particular in science, but elsewhere. Um, and as I said, uh, Helen Longino is one of the people who's given a, a, a lot of thought and attention to this. But all, those attempts uh, tend to try to give you a characterization. Um, you know, a fairly good analytic characterization. Now, um, that's one way to treat a Bolland concept. So I guess um, <laughs> since this is hosted in uh, Germany, you, you have to forgive my uh, uh, pronunciation and also my story about what Bolland is. Um, but uh, I, it's a concept I learned from my hero Otto Neurath and uh, we think of it in terms of it's a congestion where there's it's got rough boundaries there's a lot of different there's a lot of stuff stuffed into it and a lot of different kind of things all at once and what one matters on what occasions uh, can be very much uh, context dependent uh, and so what we have a picture here is of a Bollingsgebiet uh, in um, uh, in South America, you know, the east coast of America is uh, Bollingsgebiet. It's you know one of these dense, crowded areas that's got it does have gaps and it's got funny fringes of, uh, and um, and there's a lot of different kinds of things stuffed into it. Now, it, we claim in our book uh, that um, we have a duty, we all of us, uh, with engaging in science in any way or about science, we have a duty to be objective in our use of science. Okay. Uh, this is a quote from the book, the duty to be objective carries a burden of responsibility. So you see, we, uh, without, without thinking about the Weizsäcker Center uh, and your projects, uh, we have been linking uh, our notion of objectivity with the burden of responsibility. So I think that um, responsible science is objective science. Objective science might be more than responsible science, but at least um, you, uh, you're not doing responsible science if you're not doing objective science. Um, uh, okay, so um, now I want to claim and explain that the use of a science product is not objective responsible unless it is so remember, I, th I think of science products as tools put on the shelf for, um, for people to take down uh, and projects to take down and use. So the use of a scientific product is not objective and responsible unless that product is the right tool for the right purposes, where right intertwines both epistemic and moral considerations. Okay. Um, we think of objectivity as analogous to um, a, an English concept, a duty of care. So let me tell you a little about English tort law. There must be and is some general conception of relations giving rise to a duty of care of which the particular cases found in the books are but instances. The rule that you are to love your neighbor becomes in law, you must not injure your neighbor. You must take responsible care reasonable care, sorry, to avoid acts or omissions, which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbor. You see that the description is at a very abstract level. It doesn't come down and tell you what a duty of care uh, consists in. It says that the case, put, and it doesn't list um, a very specific set of things that you have to do. It says that the particular cases found in the books are but instances. And then uh, you're offered the neighbor test, Persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected um, when I'm directing my mind to acts or omissions. So again, it stays at a very abstract level where um, you're not told what it consists in, um, in your case. And again, we've got the idea of a reasonable person. The person concerned is sometimes described as the man in the street or the man in the Clapham omnibus. Such a man taking a ticket, I love this one, such a man taking a ticket to see a cricket match at Lord's 
would know quite well that he was not going to be encased in a steel frame to protect him from the one in a million chance of a cricket ball dropping on his head. So that's uh, not um, what uh, duty of care, uh, Lord's cricket grounds duty of care requires of them. Okay. Now, um, we talked about having the, uh, finding the right tool for the right purposes. And we borrow a, a lot from uh, Hasek Chang in thinking about purposes. Uh, Hasek uh, Chang di di distinguishes between what he calls the internal, uh, inherent or internal purposes of an activity or a scientific endeavor and the external purposes. And his own example is match lighting. So let's just use it where the inherent purpose of the activities that you engage in and lighting a match is getting the match lit. Okay. But the external purpose can be variable. It can be lighting a candle because the electricity went off, setting a forest on fire as an act of arson, wanting, as he says, uh, because he loves this, to watch and admire the marvelous process that combustion is. <clears throat> so now, um, I said that you're, that responsible and objective science requires use of science, a science product requires using the right tool for the right purpose. And um, following on from the ideas of duty of care, uh, you know, what are the right purposes uh, will vary from what are the right purposes for objectivity and responsibility is gonna vary very much from case to case. So it's the context that fixes the inherent uh, both the inherent and the external purposes. You'll forgive me if I slip in the, the, the easier language of internal and external. Um, Hasek really does say inherent and external, uh, and I'll try to stick with his terms. Now, context uh, includes um, sometimes explicit instructions. And, you know, you're um, uh, you're given a job um, to light uh, to set a forest uh, on fire, or um, light the candles because the electricity has gone off. Um, but it usually uh, you're, uh, goes far beyond that. There'll be material facts about the circumstances and there'll be norms and expectations uh, in the circumstance. And context, if it's going to do the job of delim delimiting what the internal and external purposes are, has got to include all of that and probably much more. So it's an interesting study to um, think about exactly uh, what context um, has got, how to think about context so that you can see what, what context must be if it's going to um, delimit what the purposes uh, are. And the context of the um, insurance salesman uh, having a responsibility with duty of care is quite different from uh, a nurse, for instance. Okay, let's carry on. Now, <clears throat> The, we make a lot of use uh, in the book, and I think this is, a, this is a, an important thing I want to stress for uh, the Weizsäcker Center, uh, that in, in the sense of this, you know, we have a, a, the duty of objectivity um, is a, carries heavy responsibility, and it's a duty to be responsible. Um, we make a lot of use of a notion uh, invented by Eleonora Montuski uh, called objectivity to be found. So objectivity, I said, uh, is a demanding duty and like duty of care, okay, it's your responsibility to find the tools that serve the purposes. So when the insurance salesman is assigned, um, is told you know, he has a duty of care to his customers, um, it's, it isn't listed for him. There are some instances given, but generally it's not listed for him what actually has to do, what the insurance salesman's got to do. She's got to find the tools that serve that purpose, the purpose of um, rendering a duty of care. Okay. Um, but in science, it's clear you're not only supposed to find the tools that serve the purposes, but find the tools that serve the purposes with no unacceptable side effects or is limiting them as much as possible. Um, and in order to do that, <laughs> you actually have to think about the tools and find the range of the effects that the use of that tool and that, uh, and that setting for that purpose uh, is going to result in. And then think about find what's acceptable. I mean, is it or is it not acceptable uh, to um, expose the, uh, the patient to uh, a, a certain risk, okay? 
And then you have to find the right purposes. So you define the tools that serve the purposes and then find what the actual right purposes are. Uh, again, you're just not told these all, all the time and you don't get off the hook of being objective and doing responsible science by saying, nobody told me to do that. And the kind of purposes that you, the right purposes that you have to find are both the inherent and the external ones. So this, this does make objectivity and responsibility a, a very demanding duty. So I wanna give um, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an example. The example is developed by Per Luigi Barotta and Eleonora, uh, and it's the case of the Veyant Dam and the Dolomites. So there was a huge disaster, 9th of October, 1963, 10.39 p.m., 260 million cubic meters landslide fell from Mont Toc into the artificial lake behind the dam. So this wonderful dam had been constructed. It was constructed mostly to generate electricity. It, it created a huge artificial lake behind it. Uh, what happened was that um, at about 10.30 in the evening, um, uh, there was a huge landslide. All of this uh, rock fell into the lake. It, the dam held and there were no escape mechanisms or just small ones. The dam held, which it was built to do. And so there was a gigantic tsunami that swept over the top of the dam and rushed down the valley and uh, killed thousands of people. So here is uh, what we saw before and there is after. And here's a, one of the villages down Langaroni right after the disaster. Now, was the way the dam was built and the tools that were used in designing and building the dam um, used in a responsible way? Was that responsible scientific use or was it irresponsible scientific use? Well, it, it wasn't criminal and it's been officially decided it wasn't criminal. criminal. And actually, um, on reflection, uh, and Leonora and Pe Luigi argue, and so we endorse in the book, that it, it wasn't unusual. It's the kind of thing that any set of engineers might have done. Still, it, there was, we think, a dramatic failure of objectivity and a dramatic failure uh, for responsible use of science uh, because um, the builders and designers had the wrong purposes in focus and that helped lead them to the use of the wrong tools. So uh, think about assessing the purposes in this case. <clears throat> There's the inherent, <coughs> sorry, the inherent purpose. So most effort focused on the formidable engineering challenges of building the dam, building a dam that would stand. Uh, for instance, there was a system of 146 equations with as many unknown variables was perfected and solved. That was where the effort was going. Uh, and that was in order to build a dam that will stand. So that was the, one of the internal purposes. Now, external purposes for building a dam that will stand, um, the, the one immediately in view uh, with the whole discussion about building it had started with the need to generate electricity. Um, and there, that was a clear, um, that was a clear uh, objective, objectively given, explicitly given external or fairly explicitly given um, external purposes. Um, obviously, safety is another external purpose, and that's an obvious one. Okay, and there were probably many others. Uh, probably safety was Kumpnicht and Fraga. Okay. Um, the problem is that the safety purposes were not taken seriously enough in the choice of tools given the stakes. So the focus was on the internal uh, purposes and then alternatively uh, on the external purpose of generating electricity and um, insufficiently on an obvious and um, expected external purpose of uh, safety. Safety purposes not taken seriously enough, given the stakes. 
Um, so here we see the issue of the intertwining of the moral and the epistemic, that they were not taken seriously enough given the stakes. Uh, this is the kind of thing that philosophers now who talk about the intertwining of facts and values in science uh, bring out all the time. Okay, so there was there was a well-established scientific theory used. Um, this is a pastiche, of course, of what uh, uh, of the whole story, but um, to, just to make uh, a, a clear point, uh, the lead engineer Carl Semenza. Uh, said, look, from a geological point of view, the rocks of the Veneto region are generally very good. Overall, the limestone is honest because it reveals its flaws on the surface. Okay. Um, well, that was a very well-established generic claim. Generally, limestone wears its flaws on its faces. Um, they looked at the limestone in the region. There was no reason on the face of it that there was anything wrong with the limestone. It looked, you know, it looked perfect um, and perfectly acceptable. Limestone is generally honest, reveals its flaws on its surface. So um, no more uh, serious investigation was done. Uh, whereas in fact, the landslide was a limestone landslide um, from flawed limestone that turned out not to wear <clears throat> its flaws on the, on the surface. So more is needed uh, given the external purpose of safety and that safety relative to the moral harms that might be involved. So more information was needed and a more objective assessment that more is needed, right, was needed. So what knowledge was overlooked? Well, principally um, local knowledge. And yeah, we can think of local knowledge in two senses, knowledge of local facts and knowledge possessed by locals. Okay. So thinking first of knowledge of local facts, um, the kind of knowledge that was required was for instance, the chemical and physical characteristics of the rocks forming the terrestrial crust there the geological characteristics of landslides and their behavior, and particularly in the region, technological knowledge concerning the resistance of dams to the pressure of water and appropriate tools to measure the stability and hydraulic seal of the chosen area. Okay. Um, now, uh, that was the kind of uh, local knowledge, knowledge of local, sorry, knowledge of local facts that was needed. And it's needed in order to go from the general to the particular. Remember I said that um, they, Semenza and the other engineers based their um, proceedings on the generic truth that limestone wears its flaws on its face. Now this is a general truth. It's not universal um, and it doesn't come with, it does so, you know, wears its flaws on its face except in, and then a list of very precise exceptions. It really comes as a, 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 as a generic where <clears throat> um, it's open that it will, uh, on, you know, on occasion not do so. So here um, we're, we're not looking in, when we look at generics, we're not looking at questions of logical implication, right? It's really a question of building a judgment of empirical relevance, um, whether you can rely on this in, this, in, in the situation at hand. How do you go from this generic to the particular that this limestone wears its flaws on its face. Um, and to do so, it's a question of not, you know, logical implication, as I said, it's a question of building a judgment of the empirical relevance of this generic to this case. And we have to do that with due regard to the moral demands. Now, so even, um, even if the limestone had not failed, uh, it, we might still, having now considered it, thought that relying on the generic without further investigation of the facts of the particular region was irresponsible science, unob not objective um, in the circumstances given uh, how much morally was at stake. Okay. Now, the other kind of knowledge that was overlooked was knowledge possessed by locals. 
Um, so <laughs> here's a quote. It doesn't take a geologist to know the land where a community lived for centuries, the movements of the moon and of the winds, their ways of combining with humidity and temperature. So there was a lot of local knowledge that um, the limestone was not safe. Um, for instance, um, this is just a, a short uh, uh, to, uh, summary. Mount Tok is short for Patok, which means spoiled, rotten, or damaged. I mean, there was, uh, there was a lot of specific knowledge of specific places where uh, there had been lands, landslides all, all around that valley uh, where the lake was formed. So um, you, we have to decide uh, the relevance in these cases. Deciding the relevance of this generic or of the local knowledge or even the relevance of the need to look for local knowledge, um, it, it unfortunately, uh, there's no set procedures for doing so. It requires judgment. And making these judgments, uh, whether you know this is a good tool to use for this occasion, have we considered the right, found the right tool for the right purposes, um, those kinds of judgments, have we done so or not, can be made more or less objectively or more or less responsibly. Where relevance uh, is a local relation uh, that depends on context. So um, the, the judgment that um, the limestone wears its flaws on its face um, can be a good, uh, the, sorry, <laughs> the judgment. Limestone wears its flaws on its face right? um, is perfectly okay to depend on in this circumstance, right? Will be highly dependent on whether that's a, the, a good judgment, a responsible objective judgment will depend heavily on the context. And it probably should not have been relied on. It was irresponsible to rely on it where so much was at stake. Okay, so now let's just return uh, to linking objectivity and responsibility. Um, given the context, including the possible huge moral costs, the decision not to use, not to look for local knowledge was objectively mistaken, it was not an objective decision, and it was irresponsible science, or so we uh, argue. Uh, and here, yet again, we see the intertwining of the moral and the epistemic, and that they can't be separated out. Uh, what is the right tool for the job that can sound like just a, an epistemic matter, but given that you have to pick the right job uh, and keep clearly in mind, and this was not the right tool given um, the a job of safety. So parting thoughts, uh, and these are really very brief. I want to leave you with, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to leave you with some projects. Um, responsible science is a heavy burden, okay? Um, and we do have to differentiate being objective. You, you, we are given a duty to be re objective and be responsible and uh, we do have to separate the idea of actually succeeding from being as objective as a reasonable man could be expected to do, um, because you can't really uh, fault people uh, for uh, failing to be objective so long as they've uh, done everything that's required to be as objective as a reasonable man. So I do want to uh, uh, allow that, um, but uh, it's still, uh, responsible science, being as responsible as a reasonable man, is a heavy burden. Okay, you must take reasonable care to avoid acts or emissions which you can reasonably foresee. Okay. Um, still, um, some individuals will be very bad at this. So they simply there are certain some people who just shouldn't sell insurance because they they just don't understand when they're confronted with a case. <laughs> what their duty of care in this case is. Uh, and some of us uh, should not be engineers designing uh, dams and all sorts of uses of science. Um, some of us would be very bad at actually being able to do responsible uh, even uh, should we like want to uh, and take pains to. So um, the Veyant Dam, uh, at least we think is, um, Leaves you with a leaves us with a lesson in collaboration, which I think is just the kind of thing the Weizsäcker uh, Center is keen on. Um, that we think that individuals, individual scientists, um, or en individuals engineers, in the case of the Veyant Dam, um, just 
putting a lot of burden and urging individuals to be better isn't the core solution because responsible science is a systems problem. I mean, some individuals just won't be good at it. How do you design the system so that the right individuals are doing the job at the right time or overseeing it um, so that um, the uh, responsible science use is fairly um, likely to happen. So this seems to me to be a good job uh, for uh, the Weizsäcker Center uh, to try to figure out how to improve the system uh, in order to secure more objective and more responsible science. So not just what does more objective, more responsible science consist in, um, and then sort of urging us all to get out and do it, but how to improve the system uh, that will make it easier uh, for us to do more objective and more responsible science. And we want to um, be able to figure that out both for uh, accrediting, the one I didn't talk very much about, um, accrediting scientific products and for using them. So thank you.